Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audible.com slash drift. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Storytime is anytime with Audible.com. Welcome to the Drift and Ramble podcast. I'm Steve Blizzen. Each episode, we'll explore true stories and American legends. From the pages of history and a few stories handed down over the years, we'll look at the people, places, and events that helped shape a nation. Stories of survival, notable frontier men and women, explorers who struck it rich, and the outlaws that stole it from them. There'll be studies of saloon girls, swindlers, banditry, and bad men, profiles of lawmen and American Indians, and the good and evil that existed between them. We'll amble through the past, we'll delve into the folklore of the times, and maybe even uncover a ghost story or two. So, saddle up, or settle in, for the Drift and Ramble podcast. This is Season 1, Episode 5. The road to riches is rife with risk. In 1849, hordes of hopefuls left the security of all they'd ever known to come to California, where the gold was said to be just lying on the ground for the picking. But the arduous voyage, unknown dangers, sheer determination, and dumb luck can be too much for most to handle. Only a few intrepid souls who do find wealth can hold it in their trembling hands for more than an instant, and fewer still can keep it in their grasp for any length of time. The lure of finding gold has driven men past the edges of sanity since before recorded history, but in the early days of the Old West, the dream of rags to riches held exceptional pull. Like moths to flames, Men made their way into the luscious valleys, the cruelest deserts, the steepest mountains, to brave the unforgiving wilderness to pick up easy money off the ground. But nothing is really ever that easy. On today's episode of the Drift and Ramble podcast, the story of two brothers, full of youthful exuberance, unaware of the strange and wonderful wilderness they will soon encounter. The boys leave home in Pennsylvania and sailed to Mexico to begin the adventure of a lifetime, their journey to find gold. We'll follow closely in their footsteps because these two bright young adventurers left us an incredibly detailed trail of breadcrumbs in the form of a series of 82 letters describing their journey and the discoveries they made. But not all that glitters is gold. For some, there is an incredible tide of silver waiting to be discovered. But be careful what you wish for because striking it rich can cost you everything. As our story begins, we land in Philadelphia as the gold rush is in full swing. Eastern fortune seekers, not wanting to risk the tedious journey out west over land, instead line the shores to find ships to sail them southward, some sailing around the Horn of South America while others turn towards the Gulf of Mexico. These two brothers take this route, landing in Tampico, Mexico. From there, they will travel overland to Mazatlan, where they will once again set sail for San Francisco. It's a journey fraught with peril and unimaginable hardships. A couple of notes to help clarify the meaning of certain items in this story. To aid in the journey to find gold out west, Many companies are formed that pool the resources of participants to help cover the costs of travel in exchange for a portion of any gold these young hopefuls will find. Essentially, these people become employees, contracted and obliged to share their wealth. One such company has formed in Redding, Pennsylvania, called the Redding, California Association, and it's attracted the hopes of the two young brothers. 
Another point that comes up occasionally in these letters is that Nevada is not yet a state at this time in history. The area is referred to as part of the Utah Territory. So when you hear someone refer to Utah, rest assured they mean Nevada. I do hope I say that correctly as many listeners have complained about my ignorant use and pronunciation of the name of their great state. The brothers are Alan and Hosea Grosh of Reading, Pennsylvania. They are the first and second-born children to Reverend Aaron and Hannah Grosh. Ethan Allen Grosh is 24, and his younger brother, Hosea Ballou Grosh, is just 22. As we join them, the two boys are nervously inquiring as to the whereabouts of their mother, who had planned to see them off on their journey. They are afraid they might miss their mother's arrival, and this gives us the first glimpse at how connected they are to family. Though never mentioned in the letters, they must have had the chance to say farewell. Listen now as Alan describes his first vision of the sea. March 2nd, 1849, off the Cape. Dear Father, the brave sky over us the wild, wild sea before us. Oh, it is a glorious sight. Yes, the sea, the sea, the open sea. How much we have lost by not seeing it before. Our ship is leaving everything behind us, and we just passed the Levant, which left for Cape Pleasant the day before we did. We are all in excellent spirits and bid adieu to land with high hearts and high hopes. Tell the girls that they have fitted us out about as well as anyone in the party. Farewell, love to all, your son, Alan. The Grosch boys are well-educated, dutiful, and dedicated to their family. Through these letters, you will come to know them as positively enthusiastic, loving, and responsible young men who look out for each other as their adventures unfold before them. They document it all with such incredible detail that what's missing also becomes part of the story. There is virtually no account of their travel by sea, which must have been unpleasant at best. Tickets to sail were $100 to $400 per man, depending on the route, and while many ships boasted of luxury accommodations, what passengers actually received was often so cramped they had to sleep standing up. Once underway, they had limited fresh water and usually rancid food. Spoilage was inevitable, rats were common, and seas were unpredictable. Some ships were simply converted whalers, never designed or intended for carrying throngs of fortune seekers. Nearly all were overcrowded, with one captain recounting that these ships were filled to cram nation. The close quarters and horrific conditions on board were only made worse by the health and hygiene of the times. Pestilence, seasickness, scurvy, cholera, yellow fever, and limited opportunity for the luxury of regular bathing must have made the journey a treat for all the senses. Or perhaps it was just that the excitement that lay ahead was far more worthy of documentation by the boys. Regardless, what lay ahead offered no better conditions. The overland route through Mexico was as hard as any journey through unforgiving terrain at the time. Alan tells his father of their plans to travel to Mazatlan after landing in Tampico. April 9, 1849, Tampico, Mexico Dear Father, we at last have everything packed up and will start tomorrow morning, early, for Mazatlan via San Luis Potosi. Thankful that we escaped the horror of fleas and mosquitoes, which have nearly eaten us up alive in this otherwise beautiful and delightful little city. Our delay has been owing to the difficulty in procuring horses, Captain West's letter to his agent here having never been received. The news we receive here from Mazatlan concerning transportation up the Pacific coast is anything but favorable, 
and it is highly probable that we will make the journey all the way by land, in which case it would have been about as well to have gone by way of Cape Horn. However, we are here, and if it takes six months to reach the Sacramento River, it must. Our first three days' march will be a hard one, hot and poor water, but after that we expect a cooler climate and no inconvenience from bad or short water. Our horses are good, and the train of mules is every way in fitting condition. Should we receive information at Durango of difficulty in engaging passage at Mazatlan, I should not be surprised if we struck onto the old military road a little this side of Durango and proceeded direct for the headwaters of the San Joaquin. I will probably have an opportunity of writing from that place, so we'll let you know. Our stay in this place, take it all in all, has been a very pleasant one. Captain West and several members of this expedition were here during the war and are extensively and favorably knowing, and this has given us advantages over almost any other party that has or will pass this way. The party that came by the Thomas Walter from Philadelphia about a month before we did were fleeced pretty handsomely and had not much to thank the Tampico Owens for. They were coaxed into betting on the popular game of Monty and then were fined under a law which forbids foreigners to gamble, and in a number of ways were annoyed in like manners. Yesterday afternoon I had the first good sleep since we arrived in Tampico, and I much needed it, for I was about worn out. You can have no idea of the swarms of mosquitoes and fleas with which we are infested. It is perfectly impossible to think of sleep at night, and it's almost impossible to take advantage of this last three or four days for writing, as I was too worn out and could not content myself a moment with paper and ink, though I spoiled a half a dozen sheets in attempting it. I am now writing from the top of an old rickety flour barrel, which shakes and jaws at every step at those around engaged in packing up for tomorrow's journey. I will not read it over for fear I may become ashamed to send it, and will not have time to write another. Hosea joins in love to all. Affectionately, your son, E. A. Grosh. Hosea, the younger brother, writes an entertaining letter from Tepic, Mexico, offering his father a glimpse at their life on the road to Mazatlan, and the struggles of keeping their mules on the trail. June 13, 1849, Tepic, Mexico. Dear Father, We have now come to this place which is some twenty leagues from San Blas Island. It is the place where a lot of business of San Blas is done. In coming thus far, I flatter myself that I have seen considerable of the elephant. We will remain here a few days until we can make arrangement for going up coast on a sailing vessel or steamer to San Francisco. We left Tampico on the 10th of April, about 10 o'clock, warned in advance our journey through a country reported to be very barren in water some days. We should be obliged to encamp without water. This last proved groundless, for we always had water, though sometimes very bad. Our first evening was a sudden introduction to the life that we were to lead while on the journey. It was late in the afternoon when we arrived at our stopping place, Altamira and by the time the cooking was commenced, it was dark. All confusion and botheration, we cooked our jerk beef as well as we were able, and ate chip biscuit with it, and our coffee as well as we were able in the dark, without any light but our fire. The chief of our mess was sick. The next morning we were roused, and ate jerked beef with ship biscuit and coffee. I will stop for tonight as it is late, and I am tired with looking over the treasury accounts for I was elected treasurer at San Luis Potosi and will finish in the morning. June 14th. To follow the mules all of one day is a lesson of patience that is not to be met with elsewhere. One of the mules lies down, another slips its load, another takes its course through the chaparral. The muleteer lifts him up, reloads him, and drives him without scarcely a murmur or any exhalation of breath. During the first few days we had several stampedes. Fortunately, no one was severely hurt. 
It was always an exciting time when McLeod, a splendid horseman, and all the Mexicans started off in full chase, always capturing the runaway. A full description of one day will give you some idea of the rest until we came to San Luis Potosí. We started early, sometimes as early as three o'clock, after some cold breakfast, if anything remained from supper, if not with a cup of coffee alone, to avoid as much as possible the heat of the day. Generally, we'd arrive at ten or eleven o'clock, then look for a place to cook while sheltered from the sun. Then the cooking, then to lunching, as the ship biscuit lasted, we had bread. But it was gone before we had been out a great while, and then we had to boil mush, which added much to our labor. There being a river to ford, we did not intend to start till daylight, but were delayed by the loss of some horses until past nine o'clock. We left Captain West with the sick while we went on. Just before we came to the river, we came to a fine grove of trees, which were the first we had seen since we came to Mexico that gave a good shade. Shortly, we crossed a river, the Tamasee, and stopped at a place called Le Monde, where we waited for further orders from rear guard and baggage. News shortly after arrived that the baggage by another road had passed us. Orders were immediately given that we saddle up. We started off in the hot sun and rode about four miles when I discovered that I had forgotten my ammunition bag and powder flask. Contrary to the advice of all, I rode back at full speed and fortunately found them where I had left them. Now I had nothing to do but catch up to the party, which was no small job. I started as fast as my horse could carry me, and after getting once or twice on the wrong road for a short distance and cutting across to the right one and galloping and trotting for about eight miles, I succeeded in coming up with one of the men whose horse had given out, and one of our Mexicans, when I felt relieved, I am certain to keep to the right road and catch up to the party, however late. We came to the place where we expected to find the party. Partway up the mountain, the horses, led by the Mexican and our man, refused to go on, so I went on to come up to the party and send back help. When at the top of the mountain, I found two roads and took the one to the right. After following it for about three miles, the road became very indistinct and finally divided into cow paths. Then I tied my horse and walked back. When I came to the edge of the mountain, I found from some inquiries of a couple of Mexicans I met that I was on the wrong road and went back to my horse and came back to the road where I started, just at dusk. Then I had to go down the other side in the dark, trusting my horse to find the path in the dark. I pushed on at a slow walk until nearly down. I found myself completely off the road. There was nothing to do but stay where I was or run the risk of breaking my horse's legs over the rocks, so I unsaddled my horse, tied him by the lasso to the stirrup so that any start of his would wake me. I lay on it for a pillow, my carbine leaning against a rock, ready to my hand, and composed myself to sleep. I had scarcely got to sleep when I was wakened by the barking of dogs about a half mile off. I immediately arose and started on foot for the place after taking a glance at what stars were in sight so as not to lose myself. I reached it after 15 minutes' rapid walk through the chaparral. I found our fellows encamped. They had been out for me, but meeting those who had been with me were told that I had gone back to where the mules were left, so they felt perfectly easy about it. We had left Tampico but a few days when Alan came down with diarrhea. I declare I can't spell that, which weakened him very much. The day following the one that I got lost, he was so weak that after going five miles, he gave out and was obliged to stop. I stopped with him and took him by half-mile stages, the remaining four stages after intervals of rest. I thought at one time he would not get through. We arrived about five o'clock. He cured his diarrhea some time after, but... He's not been well since. He started being troubled first with fever, chills, and weakness. He is now much better. A few days on the ocean will make him right. As for myself, my health has been good, except for that at San Luis, where I was troubled with a sour stomach and weak digestion, the prevalent disease of that portion of the country. We have had a good deal of sickness among us. 
nearly half of us being at one time or another unfit for duty. At Buena Vista, one of a half dozen places of the same name known only by the route by which they are on, we lost one of our men by congested fever and had another carried for several days on a litter and then three of them in a carriage for one day after which we lay at San Luis Potosi, where, when we left, we left Abbott behind, who did not overtake us until four days after we left Guadalajara. The man we lost was our treasurer, A. Taylor, the captain's brother. Until we reached San Luis, we had little else to eat but mush and pork fat. At San Luis, we had a little bread. Had a good deal of concern about doing our own cooking, which is a severe task, make no mistake. At San Luis, we bought a couple of wagons, which, while it supplied a want, occasioned new trouble. In traveling through this country, one is struck by the scenery. The sharp and bizarre outlines of the mountains through little foliage is seen even on them until you approach toward the Pacific when the timber becomes very fine. A great portion of the eastern part of the country is barren. Even such trees as there are afford but little shade. We generally did not find water from starting to stopping, but few trees were seen. Some days none except the bushes called chaparral, and the different varieties of cactus and prickly pear, which fifteen or twenty feet high, forming in many places the only trees. Some days we went over level plains covered with dried grass when our eyes were refreshed by the mirage that gave the appearance of water spoken of by travelers. As this is to go this afternoon by private hands, I am hurried and therefore can write no more at present, but will do so more fully by and by, if I can send it by vessel or steamer on the Pacific. Please get the directions that Dr. Bean promised to give us, but which in our hurry we forgot to get, and send them on to us? Your affectionate son, Hosea. P.S. Though Alan is not sick, he feels hardly able to write, especially as he has a letter to write our directors in his capacity as secretary. In fact, none of us feel as we did at home. Even though perfectly well, indeed, it is no easy matter to get pen, ink, and paper, and have no place to write. The latter particularly accounts for this letter being so scratched and scribbled. We'll continue with our story in a moment, but first I want to tell you about our new sponsor, Audible.com. I've been a fan and customer of Audible for years, but there's a reason why I love them so much. It's accessible just about anywhere, so you can make story time anytime. For friends and fans of the Drift and Ramble podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day free trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. You can get classics like Mark Twain's Roughing It, narrated by Grover Gardner, which we listened to on our trip to Virginia City while researching this episode. Of course, there are thousands of titles to choose from, and you can choose any title you'd like to hear, such as The Girl on the Train, or The Martian, or The Hobbit. You can even find a few titles that I've narrated. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash drift. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash drift for your free audiobook. As we rejoin the brothers, Alan is writing to his directors about the Redding, California Company representatives failing to uphold their end of the bargain. June 29, 1849, San Blas, Mexico. Captain West failed to carry us through, and we are now left on our own resources and will have to go up the coast without aid from him. We came from Tampico 50 miles by our own means. The extravagances of the captain's partner and the insufficiency of the $200 passage money are given as excuses. Some of our party are sick. At San Luis Potosi, we had to get conveyances for the ill, as some are unable to ride. Hiring a team would be $175 for 90 leagues. Buying a coach would cost from $1,500 to $2,000. Then we bought two wagons and eight mules used by the Army during the war. At Tequila, two days from Guadalajara, we were overtaken by Captain West, 
Farrelly, and what was most gratifying of all, Uriah Green, with Abbott in charge. We had never expected to see Green again. After almost insurmountable difficulties, we reached Tepic with our wagons. Here, the expedition failed. Captain West said he did not have any funds for another day's provisions. From then on, we were on our own hook. All but the sick walked. The last day, we were above our knees in water. We are here at the expense of five dollars per day each. If the fare is not more than fifty dollars per man, we will take passage on a ship that leaves on July 24th. If it is more, we must get there by some other means. We will take our wagons and mules with us if we can. There is a good market for mules. Our sick are Dr. Martin, Charles Taylor, and Abbott. Once they reach Mazatlan, they may have to wait weeks to travel by ship to San Francisco because, once again, all the ships passing through are already overflowing with passengers. Still, they arrive in August, and Hosea tells his father they have arrived. August 31st, 1849, San Francisco Dear Father, We arrived here yesterday morning with a light southerly wind. I wrote at Tepic, but still, as that letter may not have reached you, I will say that after some delay, we arranged all our affairs at San Luis Potosi, bought wagons there, and started on leaving. Abbott, though very low but in good hands with the best medical attendance, Green remained with him. At Guadalajara, we waited for West and Farrelly, who have gone back to try to recover some stolen horses. At the end of some days, we pushed on again, about twenty leagues from where we lay by, for our baggage to overtake us. We hired mules to carry our baggage, as the roads were impractical for loaded wagons. In fact, we were told that we would have to take our wagons apart and have them carried over at a place called the Barrancas. Who should come in but Abbott and Green, West and Farrelly, and the baggage guard, all in a heap? Nothing of any great importance occurred between there and Tepic. On the 24th, we started for San Blas. The road was abominable, almost impassable for wagons. One day, from daylight to dark, we made but three miles. We reached San Blas on Saturday in the evening. We managed to get up the steep hill on which the upper town is situated and got a place to stay at the usual rate of 25 cents per room. We found the sand flies an awful pest. Their bite seemed like an awful burn than anything else. At first, we thought the mosquitoes bite the worst, but we got some used to the bite of the latter, while the former grew worse and worse. I would just remark that nobody steals anything here. As to the mines, the accounts are contradictory, showing it to be something of a lottery in wages. Carpenters rank the highest, 12 to 16 dollars per day. No business is considered to pay unless it yields $1,200 per month. Allen was at the printing office yesterday, though, as to the result of the call, I have not seen him since to speak to him. Dr. Martin of our company is quite low with dysentery. Flack also has it badly. Charles Taylor is weak, but not sick. Abbott had the chills within a couple of days, but escaped yesterday, otherwise pretty well. The rest are in good health at present. On your birthday I remarked to Allen, but when mine came I did not think of it till past. We will go to the mines as soon as we can make provisions for the sick and raise the money. The fare is about fifteen dollars to the highest settlement. Each passenger is allowed one hundred pounds of baggage. I have put these things in item form, as there is no time to digest them. I was afraid I might forget some of them. As ever, your affectionate son, Hosea B. Grosh. September 29, 1849, San Francisco, Alta, California. Dear, dear father, I will be compelled to cut a long letter short for want of time, not for material. Enclosed you will find a letter from Hosea written before we left the ship Olga of Boston in which vessel we came in. The reason I did not commence earlier is that I do not like to write bad news, and though I do not give you good, yet it is better than 
I would have a few days ago. Hosea has been very sick. Though improving in the course of a few days, if no accident happens, he will be able to be about again. Dr. Martin of Allentown died on the morning of the 13th of dysentery. He had been sick almost from the time we left Tampico, last closed his eyes in the land he so anxiously wished to seize. This disease, the physicians assure me, is in its last stages very contagious. And as you will see by this letter, Hosea was suffering the fever and chills when we landed. The whole care of Martin devolved on Hosea and myself, and immediately after his death, Hosea's chill changed to dysentery, and in a day or two, he was on his back, despite injections, number six, etc. I never heard of anything like it. His confounded, patient, uncomplaining disposition prevented me from discovering how bad he really was. Judge then my consternation when, on his complaining of being tormented with visions on closing his eyes, I felt his pulse and found it indicated a violent fever. His physician, Dr. Henry B. May of Boston, an eclectic, was also suffering from the same disease and had not left his office for several days, merely prescribing from the symptoms as I gave them. I told him my fears and insisted on him coming over, it being only a few steps. He did so and was as much frightened as I had been. But I have no fear as to his recovery, and I beg you and mother, do not make yourselves uneasy about him. If it were any other than Hosea, I would be fearful still for homesickness in his present state with its serene song of past joys and memories would shake a less patient and cheerful soul terribly. Ah, home, home, sweet home. Father, it has a strange, a wildly fearful deep meaning out here, which is hard to understand while sheltered by a parental roof. I have seen more than one stout heart wither and more than one strong arm fall palsied by the thoughts of home. Dr. Martin fell victim to this insinuating, fascinating, mysterious disease whose blow falls and you know not from whence it comes and whose demons are bright, happy faces. I have been taught much wisdom, but little happiness in this long march toward the setting sun, and the things that once appeared bright and glittering now show themselves but a black, unshapely mass. It is indeed cruel to teach enthusiasm. Reality, truth, it felt so cold, so dead upon the heart as well as to crush it. Oh, how many bright dreams of youth have faded away before the stern reality. To my dismay is the discovery that I have been deceived by my companions, and more than once have your warnings, before I connected myself with this company, raised up before me. I have been greatly deceived, and I verily believe that before next spring, Hosea and I will be the only ones of the whole party revering in California or at least faithful to the stockholders. I would give almost anything to be free from my obligations. So would Hosea. And I scarcely know what to advise our friends among the stockholders. Everything is confusion. The company is as good as broken up. It depends a great deal on fortune how we succeed. If not unfortunate in the mines this fall and winter, the stockholders will get all they risked and something more. If not, it is a bleak outlook. Hosea and I have made up our minds, come what time may, we will do the best we can, and for two years we are theirs. After that time, we are free. I can do no more, neither can Hosea. As for the rest, they will be true, but they are all heartily sick of California. We have had so much sickness since our arrival that I am compelled to forgo the pleasure of writing to my friends at home and cannot even notice your letters as I should wish to. Living is high, and though we are short of funds, I feel in no way uneasy, as Farrelly has a good situation at $12 per day 
and we'll divide to the last penny. Fairly, Seyfert, Hosea, and I were fine friends throughout the journey, and though we have lost Seyfert, we three stick together like wax. My health improves every day, and I am one of the few who do not regret their coming to California. Hosea and I may not make anything the first two years, but after that, we will. Your son, Alan. Hosea has now become so ill he cannot travel. Alan remains at his brother's side through the worst of it, but as Hosea improves, Alan seeks opportunities in Sacramento. The brothers, like most of the 49ers in the settlement of San Francisco, live in canvas tents in squalid, ramshackle conditions that serve only to aid the spread of disease. The sudden and now constant influx of people into the port of San Francisco creates a hurried and veritable tinderbox of canvas and wood structures that are built so quickly and so close to each other that the threat of fire is a clear and present danger. So much so, the boys even prophesied these fears in letters home. And so indeed, fires did sweep through the area, not once, not twice, but as many as seven times between 1849 and 1851. Nearly a quarter of the entire city was destroyed by flames during the Great San Francisco Fire of 1851. But in January of 1850, Allen is in Sacramento, and he outfits a mining expedition. He is all packed and ready to leave on his excursion. Excitement is high, and his debts for supplies are even higher. January 15, 1850, Sacramento City. Dear Father, since I last wrote you, all my calculations have been knocked into pie by the sudden rise of the Sacramento River. We had just gotten our articles packed for the mines and set off only a few hours when the water was up to our door. While Mr. Davis and I were congratulating ourselves on having got off in good time, we were suddenly surprised by the entrance of the water. We had to leave our goods, turn loose his mules, and trust to Providence for the safety of both, about halfway out to the fort. In passing the first slough, a slough is an arm from the river sometimes cutting up the valley into islands, and at others running back into the country for miles and terminating abruptly. He had been compelled to unpack, carry over the goods on his back, repack, and continued on to the second slough when the water had already rose so high as to make it impossible to proceed. He turned out his mules, placed the goods on the highest ground, and left them, returning to town in a boat. They are probably all lost, and I expect I am some six or seven hundred dollars in debt. By midnight the water was over the floor of the store, and we were compelled to take shelter on the counter. Here I remained all the next day and night, but was at last compelled to abandon everything to its fate and take refuge with a friend. This is now the fourth day that I have been cooped up in the second story of a house. The water, however, is going down slowly, and by tomorrow, probably, we will be able to get out. What with terra firma again, I could say positively if I could only know how Hosea was getting on, and I would so arrange matters. It would cost no less than fifty dollars to go down to San Francisco and back, and if I do not have some word by the next steamer, I will go down. After that, I go to the mines. I could go now and take some provisions with me, but by going down to San Francisco, it will make me as poor as ever. At any rate, I go to the mines, and will take Hosea with me if he is not in a good situation. I write in a hurry and have the blues. Remember me to all my friends and give love to all the family. Truly, your son, E. Allen Grosh. P.S. I will write before I go to the mines. E.A. Evening, 2 p.s. Our losses are not so much as we first anticipated, though considerable. 
I will remain here until next week winding up affairs. Then I go to San Francisco when I shall advise you of our future course. I have just returned from the store. Not a great deal is lost. Excuse me for my brevity. All will be yet right. Thank God that the debt is incurred in California, where a wide field is open to anyone who is the sum of a man. My dearest love to all, in haste. Truly, your son, Alan. February 28, 1850, San Francisco, Northern California. Dear Father, I did not write by the last steamer as I had little or no news to send and expected to have been in the mines before this time. However, I am here yet, though my next will not be likely to be written here, as I think we will be off to the mines in a week or two. Alan came down from Sacramento City earlier this month, sick with dysentery, probably caused from taking cold during the flood. He is, however, altogether recovered, and looks full as well as usual, though not as fat as I do, for my face has grown considerably in latitude. Alan has been at Sacramento City all winter, hoping to make enough to take us to the mines, but the flood destroyed his expectations. Our going to the mines is, however, provided for, and Alan is now at work at a machine which promises to be better, much better, than any now in use in the country, besides being portable, which most of the quicksilver machines are not. Uriah Green as well, as are all the rest of the party, as far as we know, and we have heard lately of all but P. Rapp. Our boys have gone to the mines already, where we will join them soon. By the by, keep the machine quiet. We will write at full length when we get to the mines. In haste, your affectionate son, Hosea B. Grosh. Remember us to all who know us. January 12, 1851, Sacramento City, California. Dear Father, being unexpectedly detained here over today, I cannot but give you some revelations which were undeveloped when I finished the letter I send with this. Hosea and I are, in all probability, rich men. During the summer past, we have explored the country lying between the South Fork of the American and the North Fork of the Cosumnes Rivers pretty thoroughly. And from the information given me below, I think we are knowing of two or three and have possession of one extremely rich veins of gold-bearing quartz. I mentioned incidentally to my friend Holland of my being acquainted with several veins in our region and gave him descriptions of several specimens we had found. By him, I was at once introduced to Professor Nooney and Shepard, both geologists to high standing here, and both engaged in quartz operations. Of course, I was obliged to conceal locality, etc., but still could give sufficient information as to the eligibility of the situations and some few facts illustrating their richness, etc., which seemed to create some little sensation between the two professors. The vein which we have possession of, Hosea is now exploring. We have had our eye on it for this couple of months past, though from the information Professor Nooney gave me, it must be rich, twenty-fold beyond our highest calculation. Holland, Fairley, Hosea and myself, and three persons to whom we have mined during the last summer, whose honor, industry, and fidelity are undoubted, together with three or four others, who, though never mentioned to you before, have stood the test of a California friendship, will immediately organize, take possession, and work the mine. The vein from its decayed state will work extremely easy, and the simplest and cheapest machinery will suffice. The outlay will be trifling. The capital invested will be principally our labor. From this mine we expect the means for commencing the others a best mine we will hold on to. Mining, henceforth, is our business. Everything is in Hosea and my hands. Our right as discoverers will have its due within the organization of the company, so do not make yourself uneasy as to us being overreached, etc. The company will be composed of tried friends. Besides, 
two years' experience in California has made considerable businessmen of us. Our large lump of gold I mentioned in my other letter, $38, is from the vein we are going to commence operations on. Professor Nooney pronounced it a rare and valuable specimen, such as he had never seen before. It is extremely porous. I will get off tomorrow morning, probably, certainly in the afternoon. I come down again about this time next month. Till then, adios, love to all. In haste, truly, your son, E. A. Grosh. P.S. Please use this letter carefully. We do not wish the story to get out, etc. This injunction, of course, does not extend to the family and friends. Before I tell you what's coming up in Episode 6, I'd like to thank the Potter and family for welcoming our podcast into the family and for helping us reach new listeners. How does it work? Just search the Potter and family hashtag or follow us on Twitter and you'll be introduced to other family members with podcasts ranging from full cast audio dramas to comedy, movie reviews, full tilt sci-fi geekdom, and everything in between. Some of our personal favorite podcasts include The Unwritable Rant with Juliet Miranda, Audio Oblivious Productions' Winnebago Warrior, The Tale of John Wayneby, The Dave Podcast, and if you're into NASCAR, Right Sides Only Radio is right up your alley. Families prepping for a trip to Disney theme parks will love the informative Mouse Scouts, a podcast dedicated to making the most of your time and money at Disney theme parks. And finally, Tattooed Bananas podcast is two best buds riffing on stuff. In episode six, the buds Phineas and Bill infiltrate our show as humorist Mark Twain and other characters from our story. Hi, this is Cheryl. If you enjoy our podcast, please be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And take the time to leave us a review on iTunes. Be sure to support our sponsors and perhaps consider becoming one yourself. You can visit our website at driftandramble.com for details on how to get in touch with us. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Thanks for listening to the Drift and Ramble podcast. The Grosch brothers have endured a myriad of hardships along their journey. Serious illness causing delays in their prospecting, loss of goods and equipment in a flood. That's not to mention the everyday hardships of existence in the rustic conditions of the Old West. But now... It seems as though they may have found some serious wealth. Their tests confirm a significant concentration of silver in an area they're working. Could it be what would become the Comstock Lode, America's richest silver strike? Next time on the Drift and Ramble podcast, in Episode 6, the Grosch brothers reveal the full extent of their find. Are the hard times over? Probably not, because Indians are just about to attack them. And there's a lot more left to their story. Also coming up in Episode 6, it's the arrival of Samuel Langhorn Clemens, who comes to Virginia City, works in the mines, but winds up doing something with a little less manual labor. We'll hear from local historian Joe Curtis and mining expert Corrado de Gasparis, president and CEO of Comstock Mining. Oh, and I should probably mention again that Phineas and Bill from the Tattooed Bananas podcast appear as special guest stars. It's an action-packed thrill ride of mayhem from start to finish, and it's all coming up on Episode 6. While there are vast riches in the history of the Comstock Lode, the letters of the Grosch brothers may be one of the most important treasures. These letters would not be possible to share with you had it not been for the careful preservation of the Grosch family, the Wegman family, and their descendants. The letters survived house fires, court cases, time, and the many times they changed hands and traveled about. It's a marvel they exist at all, let alone the fact that they exist where we can find them. And so, in addition to the praise and thanks the family deserves, the Nevada Historical Society is also to be thanked for pursuing these important documents for the benefit of our knowledge and consumption. Society members Eric Moody and Mella Harmon first conceptualized doing a book in 1997 
and eventually the task of editing, compiling, and decoding, if you will, these important fragments of history fell to Ronald M. James and Robert E. Stewart, who painstakingly assembled these documents into a cohesive, organized collection of not only the journey and personal history of these two young brothers, but a glimpse backwards into time itself. The book they assembled on behalf of the Nevada Historical Society is called The Gold Rush Letters of E. Allen Grosch and Hosea Grosch, and I highly recommend it for anyone interested in the authentic history of our American West, the Gold Rush, or mining in Virginia City. The Gold Rush Letters of E. Allen Grosch and Hosea Grosch is published by the University of Nevada Press and available wherever fine books are sold. Your feedback is important to us. If you have a comment or suggestion, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us through our website at driftandramble.com. You'll see a listener survey button on every page, and we'd really appreciate your input on the survey. Please take a few moments to complete it, and you'll have our thanks in return. Until we meet again, I'm Steve Blizzen. See you at the next installment of the Drift and Ramble podcast. The Drift and Ramble podcast is a Clear Voice Media production, hosted and produced by Steve Blizzen, with segment research and voice acting by Cheryl Blizzen. Additional contributions and content have been made possible by support from individuals dedicated to the art and science of storytelling and exploring the still fertile promise of the American West.